So thank you, Cornelia, for that wonderful introduction. And again, thank you and Elizabeth and Alberta Innovates for the invitation to be here. I'll try to stay on schedule. Um, I used to have a BlackBerry, and you know, when BlackBerry started to fall out of disfavor, you know, I said to people, I'm trying to support the local economy, but more importantly, it, it's a great timer. Uh, so hopefully um, I'll stay on time and get us back on. So when Cornelia and Elizabeth asked me to talk about emerging technologies and innovation in food science, I had some pause about, you know, how would I approach this? And to be honest, I think I, I'll talk about some of the challenges that we talk about. And I think many of our uh, colleagues before me have talked about these challenges. And you, know, you can see things like increasing global population. But when you come down to it in a, the real world, what really is some of the hurdles are the failure to be able to scale you know, go from that bench top to that commercializable scale, that valley of death scenario where you don't have enough money to actually show proof of concept or invest in proof of concept, the regulatory hurdles, and if you talk to people in the industry, they go, oh my God, you know, dealing with Health Canada or some other regulatory agencies and the lack of harmonization, oh, talk a little bit about that, is a real impediment. And, you know, finally, consumer acceptance. So going back to the future trends, if you ever want to talk about what technologies you should pursue, watch cartoons like Jetsons or Star Trek or read science fiction. Because if you were to read them at the time or watch them at the time they were being produced or written, about some of the technologies you go, never in my lifetime. Well, in our lifetime, we see some of the realities of some of the technologies they talked about or wrote about or actually had a cartoon about. And so I often talk about the Star Trek food replicator. It's become a reality. So if you ever want to be a futurist and make lots of money on a speaking tour, read science fiction and repeat it back to the audience. So as I said, here are some of the challenges and, and we'll talk a little bit about it. So, you know, this whole thing about 2050 and 9 billion people, and <clears throat> I hope there's not too many agrologists in the audience that I'm gonna offend, but this whole notion of produce more, right? We're gonna have to produce more, but I think there's some naivety about that whole scenario in that there's no acceptance or acknowledgement that there's going to be innovation in food science and technology. And so, you know, Paul talked about it, Joanna talked about it, Sarah talked about it, Carmen talked about it. You know, we have new methods for preservation, right? And how we extend shelf life. So I think we need to work on those issues. We need to work on issues of how do we reduce waste. And Paul talked about this and a number of other people. But the degradation of arable land. So at UBC, you know, we have a faculty that has a farm on the campus. It's 23 hectares. It's probably, if not, the world's most expensive piece of farmland. I have the UBC developers breathing down my neck, talking about converting it into high density housing. And the farm was actually saved through a social movement of let's protect farmland in the city. But that's going to be the reality. How do we actually produce enough food to supply an urban population at the expense of the diminishment of arable, you know, rural land base? The food versus fuel issue, you know, that's been a debate for the last 10 years. We plant corn, what do we use it for, food or fuel? and the tie-in with the price. And Paul talked about price point. Well, you know, a couple of cents makes a big difference because it either dictates whether the product's being sold or not sold. And so these are issues that we need to look at. This is a, this is a study and it's too small. And as I said, this presentation will be left with the organizers for distribution later. But he talks about global climate change warming, really, 
and what that's going to do to production. And so he's taken it out of anecdotal sort of conversation to actually doing a rigorous scientific analysis of the data on this. Water shortage, you know, Paul talked about this, the South Saskatchewan River. You know, if you talk to the food processors, they talk about what are the issues that they're going to deal with. Reduce energy costs, loss of water, potable water. And that not only is from a processing aspect, but from a supply chain perspective, because now they're sourcing material from areas which are actually producing drought-resistant crops. And those crops process differently. And so it has an impact on potentially the cost of processing. Well, this is the debate we have heard a lot about, this sort of dichotomy. We have malnutrition on one side and then obesity on the other side. So we're dealing with these two really extremes. And how do we supply food for both those ends of those spectrums? So this is another challenge that we face. Well, you know, in addition to you know, the price of food and how we manufacture food and process food, the cost to healthcare, and this is gonna be the factor that paralyzes all governments. You know, the amount of money we spend on health care. You know, if you talk to any government, whether it be municipal, provincial, federal, so much money is going to be spent on health care at the expense of other services. And you have the debate on, you know, should we put it into roads? Well, you know, nice to have, but at the expense of somebody being sick or dying, it's going to be a real ethical dilemma for governments. The aging population. Well, I'm a baby boomer. And, you know, you talk about, you know, marketing and, you know, where are food processors and retailers really looking at? This is a huge, huge population base, and it's a huge consumer market. So I think about my own life, right? And, and when I was a teenager, you, and I was 16, I guess the operative word was, I'm invincible. Now that you know, I approach my 50s and 60s, um, it really is vulnerability. I feel vulnerable, I feel susceptible, right? I don't, wanna, I don't wanna be ill, I don't wanna die. And that has changed the whole paradigm of what kind of foods do we have now? And I'll talk a little bit about this. Paul talked about food loss and waste reduction, right? Well, the United Nations and FAO, huge initiative on how do we reduce waste. So this is part of that, how do we feed nine billion? Well, I think we really need to work on issues around food waste too. And so here's the number I think that Paul quoted in his presentation, $750 billion a year is devoted to food waste, wow. Food safety, so one of the, I don't know if you watch PBS, I love PBS and Frontline, and a couple weeks ago they did a show on salmonella in poultry. If you watch that show, I don't think you would be eating the poultry we had at lunch. My God, it, it was scary. It was scary, right? Sorry, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great after lunch conversation, not before conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but, you know, this is the thing that, you know, sways the bar, too. The influence of media on public opinion. So, a colleague of some of you in the room who I happen to know quite well, Tim Caulfield, wrote that book, just recently published book, Is Gwyneth Paltrow Wrong About Everything? Right? You have to read it. Tim writes very well, and it's very comical. But the whole essence of that book is how these people have become icons that have become sort of, and I hate to use this analogy, a Jimmy Jones type of character where people follow them blindly. And so he debunks a lot of the issues around food and diet, you know, the Dr. Oz's of the world, right? Well, Paul also talked about this one a little bit. So colleagues of ours at, at the University of Guelph 
do this traceability stuff. So, you know, they talk a lot about, you know, um, Japanese restaurants, right? And sashimi, the, the raw fish. And, you know, you go into these restaurants and you order one of their expensive raw fish dishes, tuna, and you're really being served tilapia, right? And so there's, you know, they're benefiting from mislabeling, really fraud, right? And they've developed some technology that uses DNA, what they call barcoding, similar to what we would see on food products. And this allows us to actually validate what we're eating. But it's a big problem, not only in fish, but supplements. Holy crow, you go into any store now, uh, you know, grocery store, drugstore, and it seems to go for miles on natural health products. Are you having akinesia? Well, you know, Steve Newmaster, Bob Hanner, who does the fish side, Bob does the plant side, goes, you know what? I think you're buying alfalfa. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yikes. I don't think alfalfa costs as much as akinesia, but, you know. So there's issues around that. Vitamin and mineral deficiencies, right? Well, we in North American developed countries don't really suffer from this, but there's a huge portion of the world that suffers from mineral and vitamin deficiencies, an opportunity, I guess. Protein consumption, we heard a lot about protein consumption. And when we talk about protein consumption, I think people are talking about land-based, you know, four-legged protein. Well, yes, there's been a huge increase in some seafood, but we need to really look at alternative protein sources because if you do the analysis and, and the economic analysis, there's no way we should be investing more in land-based animals, right? Because we, it's just not sustainable. Not to say that we shouldn't do it. We should do that. But it's going to have to be a combination because we won't be able to supply the protein needs. Well, here's the bane of a lot of people who are out there in the audience who are running companies who want to market not only within Canada, but outside of Canada, the lack of harmonization. So what Health Canada requires may be slightly different what that FDA requires in the States with regards to EFSA in the, in the European community. And it's frustrating because a lot of times you have to go back to start at ground zero again. And that's time and money. And by that time, you've lose, lost competitive edge. Well, this is something that we heard a lot about, science and uh, philosophical debates. So it's interesting now with some emerging technologies, and I use you know, nanotechnologies, we're hearing the same kind of debates that we saw with, and we still continue to hear, about GMO. And what is the debate? Well, if you talk about the science, I would say that the science, current science, would say that these products are safe to consume today. I can appreciate those people who don't embrace that because their concern is, what's going to happen to me in the future? If I continue to eat these products, will we get ill? Will we get sick? Will we potentially die from... Con Good question, because science evolves, right? So what we know today may be quite different from what we know in the future, and we don't know long-term effects. We don't have a crystal ball that accurately predicts. I love Paul's comment about storms, right? The only thing that we can predict is the fact that we will have storms, you know? We can't tell you specifically what's gonna happen. So regulating direct-to-consumer personal genome testing. This is an interesting debate with these 23andMe things, right? So, you know, God, I, if I see another 23andMe commercial, like every 30 seconds, I think I'm going to get sick, right? But the, the debate is, if you know what you're susceptible to, potentially susceptible to, because it's a probability, will agencies such as insurance companies start to take that information and deny you coverage. Wow. It's a real ethical debate that we're getting into. So I would say, if you haven't picked a profession now, pick actuarial science, <laughs> right? 
consumer attitude and consumer acceptance that's tied into this. One of the big things that we saw, and I, I'm sure Paul saw this from the academic world, is that scientists have this wonderful ability to you know, discover wonderful science, develop new technologies, develop products, and, and then say, it's so wonderful, I'm sure there's a market out there, right? Well, uh, maybe not, right? And so the whole idea is, if you develop a technology or a product, it better resonate with the consumer. And I'm not saying that all science should be, you know, consumer pull or market pull. There is a lot to be said about science push because you never know some where, sometimes where this science or technology will lead to. But in today's market, wow, if you don't have a market out there, you're kind of dead in the water. So new technologies behind sciences is on that sort of same thing. This is a recent article from the New Yorker. Scientists, Earth endangered by new strain of fact-resistant humans. <laughs> wow. Read this article. It's, it's a really interesting article in the New York Times. But this is going back to that debate around science and ideology philosophy. There's going to be an element of society that regardless of the science, they're not going to be believers. It's like debating religion, right? The best you can hope for in a debate around religion is respect and careful listening, not a shout down match, right? Which sometimes you see these on TV, not only in religion, but other issues. You know, Cornelius said that, you know, I've started into this nanotechnology thing. It's an interesting area for food science because for argument's sake, 10 years ago, the large multinationals were, you know, expounding the virtues of nanotechnology. And then they started to see the consumer backlash. And so it's interesting now they've, I'll use the word sanitize their literature uh, around nanotechnology because they're fearful of being associated with the technology and the fear of consumers having this negative response. So in this article, which was in a journal, um, it talks about how much do people really know about nanotechnology? So if you went out into the casino here and asked people, have you heard about the word nanotechnology? Probably a lot of people would say, yeah, I've heard the word. If you drill down and ask them, how much do you know about nanotechnology, they'll look at you like a deer in the headlights, right? So they don't know, but they're making decisions based on, I've heard about it, or hearsay, right? So it's an issue. So let me talk about top 10 uh, food trends, and, and Joanna, you, you uh, talked about your top 10. And so this is, and I'm going to quickly go through this because Joanna's covered this off. But this is from uh, the magazine Food Technology, which is out of the Institute of Food Technologists in the state. So, you know, fresh refrigerated, you know, Joanna talked about lifestyle and, uh, you know, diet watching, you know, exclusion diets. Oh, th the whole issue around gluten free. Wow, what a market, right? Now I have friends who are saying, oh, I'm gluten free. I'm not actually sure if they're gluten free or if it's a part of a trend, right? I do have friends who are celiacs who really need to be gluten-free. But this is an opportunity for markets to, and food companies to uh, go into. Snacking, we talked about snacking. It's interesting, I think, I can't remember, Joanna, if it was one of your slides, the difference between China and Japan, yeah. right? And I'm going, wow. So I'm of Japanese heritage. I, I think I'm on the Chinese side <laughs> rather than the Japanese side, holy crow. So now, I also uh, belong to this organization called the International Life Sciences Institute based out of Washington. And they did a report uh, back at, at the end of last year for this year. And they're talking about emerging consumer trends. So natural claims, Joanna talked about that, protein, energy, health indulgence, snacking, free from. So all of these. And, the, and then the weight management ones. Um, sugar, stuff like that. So again, some uh, repeats. They talked about regulatory issues too. So this whole debate around irradiation, right? 
I don't know how long this has been going. It's been going for as long as I can remember. You know, the technology says we need to, you, we could use the radiation to extend shelf life. The, the consumer concern is that they have this image of a mushroom cloud over, you know, whatever commodity is being irradiated. An issue there is education, I guess, and educating the public about that. So we talk about risk communication. Some of the speakers talked about risk communication. Paul, I think, talked about risk communication, right? We not only have to talk about the benefits, but also the risks of new technology. And the whole notion of just expounding the benefits, I think the consumer becomes quite cynical, skeptical, if you only say, isn't this wonderful? And they go, are you sure? There's no actual negative effects. And you have to be open and transparent. Food labels, holy crow, the GMO-free debate, the gluten-free debate, you know, some of these are necessary if you talk about allergies, right? The whole possibility of eliciting an allergenic response which could be severe enough to cause the death of a person. We need to label things. I think the whole GM issue with regards to labeling is one of the consumer having the ability to make choice, right? And this is the, I think this is the issue. Should all consumers have the ability to make choice about the products that they buy? And so there's strong debates for and against. Some more regulatory issues, labeling and advertising to children. Um, we talked about the GM issues, antimicrobial resistance, you know, You've, taught, you've heard about the C. difficile, you know, issue around hospitals, you know, and how that climate change and heat stress and productivity issues. Well, this is an interesting, um, I guess, report, and this comes from Thomson Reuters, The World in 2025, 10 Predictions of Innovation. So they talk about what could happen in the future. And what I would say to people in the audience, take these as potential starting points for looking for opportunities, as Paul did with, you know, the sustainability issue, the president's choice issue. So dementia declines, I hope that happens. Solar energy is the largest energy source. So I have a friend at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee who's actually developing a solar battery using spinach leaves. So it's a solar cell, really. And so he grows this bed of spinach leaves. The spinach leaves capture the energy from the sun. And, you know, the efficiency is horrible. Like it's, you know, less than 1%. But if you think about it, the rays from the sun are free, right? So even if you have bad efficiency, you get some energy out of it. Type 1 diabetes is preventable. I hope type 2 is also. Food shortages and price fluctuations are a thing of the past. This is so Star Trekian, right? If you talk about Star Trek and Captain Kirk goes, you know, we live in a world where there's no food shortage and there's no, you know, da, da, da. This is, but how do we actually develop foods if we were ever to get there? Electric air transportation takes off. God, I saw, I saw the, the flying boat, you know, or the flying car thing. Digital every, everything, everywhere. This is where I'm probably going to be at the dinosaur, right? And I'm going, oh my God, I'm so techno naive. I'm referred to as a techno peasant, right? That this is going to kill me, right? Petroleum based packaging is history. We're looking for alternative um, packaging material. Cancer treatments, wow. Talk about an issue that's been worked on since, you know, sh just shortly uh, after people came out of the primordial soup. DNA mapping at birth is the norm, and this is to really manage dis uh, disease risk. And teletransportation, well, this is Star Trek, right? So hopefully you can take some of these as starting points. So let me get to food, and I'm going to talk about nanotechnology because this is the area that I know best. These are some of the applications that nanotechnology is in being involved with in the agri-food space, and I'm not going to read this slide. But the issue here is bringing these kind of products to market in a commercializable, you know, consumer-acceptable, regulatory-approved manner. 
lab on a chip. So this is probably one of the easier technologies to commercialize because they're, oops, sorry. And I see I get the 15 minute warning, so I'm not exempt. Uh, so, you know, with regards to salmonella and pathogen testing, right? I did my undergraduate degree in microbiology and I remember the days of, you know, you would take a sample and it'd take three or four days before you even got to some sort of identification. By that time, if you think of yourself in the food industry, you're holding product or the product's gone out the door and it's a recall situation now. You talk about a costly venture, holy crow. If we can do it online, just on time, just in time, you know, how much would that save us? You know, this is the technology we need to look at. So this is a microfluidic lab on a chip that's been developed one of the, by one of the faculty members back in my faculty um, at UBC. Nanosensors, well, you talk about the ability to be able to tell if a product has been, a uh, package has been compromised or not, and that could be to the air, to m microbes coming in. The whole notion of just having a little sticker change color and saying, hey, you know what? There's, it's being compromised. In days gone by, no. I remember as a kid, I remember seeing this little boy open up all these containers, put his finger in, and close it back up. And you would have never known if you came by later on that the little boy had done that, right? Now you can. This is the company that Paul referred to, our, our colleagues at, at Guelph, True ID, who do the DNA barcoding. Sprinkles, simple technology, developed at the University of Toronto at Sick Kids. Micronutrients, you know, the sprinkles that kids talk about putting on cakes and whatever. They put micronutrients in that kind of format. You can just sprinkle it onto food. Simple technology like that can address a huge problem. Nano encapsulation, the whole idea of encapsulating vitamins, nutrients, and the whole issue here is can we actually deliver nutrients, vitamins, more efficaciously to the target areas? And now technology may be able to do that for us. Here's something around iron. So iron fortification for the women in the audience, anemia is a big problem for some of women. And all the other platforms are not that acceptable. There's cloudiness, there's a color, da, da, da. So the bottle on your left hand side, oh sorry, your right hand side is, or left hand side, sorry, is a product that was developed by a colleague in Japan. He has this company. And it looks like water. So if you were iron deficient and had to use some sort of remedy, what would you want to do? drink something like water or something that looks like, you know, mud, a mud puddle kind of thing. Again, we can start to use value add too. In the agricultural community, one of the challenges we have in Canada is not marketing, you know, beyond commodities, right? So, you know, we often export our raw commodity and import back a finished product. Well, let's start thinking about value add, and this is using the casein protein as a delivery system. Protein, we can look at various proteins. This is an interesting product developed by uh, Campbell's Canada, Nourish. It's using naked oat, uh, a, an oat that was developed in Canada, high protein, high fiber. We can use things like this. Cultured beef, you know, the whole issue around meat in a tube. And so I was at a meeting in Vancouver where Jay Ingram was doing this sort of public forum about, uh, about science. And one, and one, I think, uh, person in the audience talked about meat in a tube. And they go, what do you think about that? And I said, well, and I, I guess I was really quite flippant at that point. I says, you know, we eat meat in a tube. It's called hot dogs, right? <laughs> right? They weren't talking about that kind of meat in a tube. But is this an alternative? It may be, right? It may be that we can culture meat cells. Uh, insects, uh, you know, a number of universities are pursuing insects, right? I think what they need to do is transform the insects into something else, like a flower or a powder. The whole idea of eating insects is not uh, amenable to a lot of people. But it's a wonderful thing, 23andMe. This is a company that was developed in, at U of T. So you talk about innovation, well, it does exist in Canada. Uh, foods for the aging, 
Well, you know, we talked about texture. I, I think, Joanna, you talked about texture, right? Well, if you talk about what's the big challenge for people who age, inability to chew. And so you really need to develop foods that are appealing, that are soft enough to chew. And so sensory properties, and I, and I see my old colleague, Wendy Wismer here from the University of Guelph, who's now here at U of A. But Wendy does a lot of work on sensory aspects. And so we really need to develop foods other than pureed foods, which I would find objectionable. 3D printing of foods, Star Trekian, well, it's become a reality. So these products have been produced through a 3D printer. I was talking to one of our electrical engineers at UBC about, hey, do you think you could actually interface technologies of genomics with 3D printing so that, you know, you're coming home from work and you go, well, you know, I'd like to have, for argument's sake, say something that looks like a steak but meets all my nutritional requirements. Will we get to that point? I think so. Food engineering, and I apologize for the size of this slide, but there's a food engineering conference that's going on this year at McGill, and they're, they're talking about all sorts of new technology, non-thermal processing, right? So high pressure pasteurization, the use of, pa you know, the ability to pasteurize without using heat. This is kind of an interesting technology that will be used. Biomimicry, wow, you know, can we mimic things that we see in nature, right? And actually develop some healthy products that way. I think it'll be a reality. Novel materials, this is another uh, colleague of ours at the University of Guelph. They've developed this platform from using starch from corn to be used as a delivery system and they're in the fundraising aspect. But their challenge will be, can they raise enough capital to e keep that company going? Merging technologies, well, as I said, genomics and engineering, mathematics and, because the power of math and uh, the ability to predict and model. Well, let me end up by talking about some facilitators that we have in Canada. As I said, we have a problem in Canada of scale sometimes, having places that we can go to test out ideas. This is an organization called Food Tech Canada, which is really the organization of, of the pilot processing facilities across Canada. You can do some scale up there. You can do some processing there, um, proof of concept. Please utilize these facilities. Um, and this is a bit of self-promotion, but uh, Cornelia referred to the organization Advanced Foods and Materials. We were a network of centers of excellence. We act as basically a match.com kind of organization. If you have an issue, then we try to find the partners and build research groups around them. So with that, I'll conclude, and I hope, Jonathan, I've met my time allotment. Okay, good. I'd like to thank a number of people, but at the end, I'd like to thank uh, the sponsors of this uh, meeting, Alberta Innovates, Alberta Agriculture uh, and Forestry, and the food processors. So thank you very much, and uh, I think I may have time for one question. Thanks very much.